I should have bought some better sake. Yet another brilliant episode of Shogun. This series so far has developed the habit of introducing some new knowledge or event in the very last scene that changes the entire course of the story for all involved, yet at the same time seems to be a natural course of events. There's no long lost cousin appearing out of nowhere. The events lead naturally from one to the other until something has to give. And in episode 4 of Shogun, The Eightfold Fence, the ending really throws everything on its ear. Poor old Yabushi. The guy can't catch a break. Some will say he's duplicitous, but I just see him as a man who will do his best to survive. And the powers that be are just constantly throwing roadblocks in his path. Poor bugger. I'm enjoying the changing relationship between Blackthorn, Mariko and Fuji. While it does feel a little rushed to me, I can justify it as a difference of culture, exemplified by the title of this episode, wherein the Japanese people will put aside their own desires in order to satisfy their duties to their people and the country. When Fujisama defended Blackthorn, I felt a weird mixture of happiness and excitement. I told you she was not to be trifled with. There's some really touching scenes between Blackthorn and the two ladies. I wish we could have a 20 episode season so we could explore some more of this aspect of the show. If I have to have a negative, I will say that I was annoyed with the absence of Torinaga for a large part of this episode. He's one of my favourite characters and the fact that he is absent also leads to one of if not the major plot point that felt almost a little too convenient. The ending scene could also be said to hold a little too much shock value. I'm fine with it. I thought it looked terrific and added a little bit of griminess to an otherwise very serene episode. But it does kind of come out of nowhere and feel a little bit like a talking point for around the water cooler. I also would have liked to have seen a few scenes from back in Osaka, maybe find out more about the reaction to the end of the last episode with Hiramatsu and the four remaining Boo Shows. All up, I'm giving episode four of Shogun, The Eightfold Fence, a nine out of 10. Again, I enjoyed myself all the way through. Again, I felt sick in the pit of my stomach whenever the screen went black because I was hoping it was not the end of the episode. The production quality is so amazingly high level that you would think that you were watching a feature film every episode. The landscapes are beautiful, even commented on by Blackthorn himself. Unless you're from Canada, I don't think you would feel like this is not filmed in the Japans. Sucks to be you if you're a Kanak. There's still another 6 episodes left in Shogun's 10 episode run, so I'm cautiously optimistic that they can keep the level of quality entertainment going for another 6 weeks. Hell, I'm so excited that I've taken the next 6 Wednesdays off work so I can get my reviews out earlier. So subscribe to ensure you don't miss out. Now on to the spoilers. A messenger arrives in a Jiro and old mate with the pigeons Miraji gives him a bit of a sideways glance. Yabushi and Toronaga are on their way. Preparations must commence for their arrival. Mariko is giving Fuji the good news. As Hatamoto, Blackthorn needs a consort and seeing as she's recently single, she'll fit the bill nicely. She'd rather go and become a nun than serve a barbarian. This is a really good back and forth between Mariko and Fuji as they have both recently lost their husbands and now must continue their legacy. Very well acted, especially by Moika Hoshi. You can really feel her fighting with her inner disgust and her outward appearances. Nagakado Toronaga's son takes a much more prominent role in this episode with his father's absence. He lets Yabushigi know that Toronaga has resigned from the council, and Yabushigi wants to know if he's going to commit Sudoku. I love that he's got his feathery pimp jacket on again. I love the old duck who complains that if she knew Toronaga was coming, would have bought the good sake. And then when he leaves, she says they wasted the average sake and should have got the cheaper stuff. Yabushigi's men chant his name, and then he has them chant Toronaga's name. And Toronaga one-ups him by bowing and acknowledging them in a show of respect. I love how he's waving his fan, and then the next thing you know, he's on a boat and out of here, all the while getting chanted off. Blackthorn is reacquainted with Omi, Yabushigi's nephew, and this time, he doesn't get urinated upon. I enjoy the snide remarks under his breath. I'm just curious if this is said in Portuguese so Mariko can understand, or purely in English. I've been told that the majority of the army is races other than Asian, as it was filmed in Canada, so that's why the soldiers past the first few rows are hiding their faces with their hats. Blackthorn wants his men, guns, and ship, but Mariko teleports behind him and tells him that they're Toronagas now. The men are in Edo. Mariko comes across very cold here. Like she's telling Blackthorn where his place is in the food chain, and it's below Toronaga, and that's the end of it. I guess it must be weird for these Japanese people to see such an outward expression of emotion. 
I thought more could have come from the introduction of the gardener. They introduce him as Uijio, and Blackthorn addresses him as Uijio Sama, thinking Sama is like Mr. as a show of respect. But I guess it's just for the nobles, because he refuses the title and Mariko corrects Blackthorn quite strongly. I hope he becomes good friends with him as a show of egalitarianism. Remember that word? Egalitarianism? Whatever happened to that concept? Anyway, back to Shogun. I like it how Mariko and Fuji are taking great care to walk on the stepping stones, while Blackthorn plogs along through the garden like a big galoot. This is a very well crafted scene with so much exposition, well disguised. Blackthorn is told that he is stuck here for six months. That is how long it's going to take to train Nagakado and his men. I always get a chuckle when Blackthorn says he doesn't want any generous cuckoos. A cuckoo is the amount of grain to feed a person for a year. Yabushiki is upset that Toronaga left after he risked his life to bring him to Ajiro. Omi sets him straight that this is an opportunity. They have the guns and Toronaga is probably still going to be impeached. So they can hand Ishida a fully trained regiment of cannon teams. Kiku's totally not listening in though. Blackthorn doesn't want Fuji following him, but that's not the custom in Japan. Mariko tells him that he should go easy on her as she's a recent widow and her child was killed. Blackthorn says that she should be grieving then rather than following him around. Mariko tells him about the Eightfold Fence. Ooh, the name of the episode. Apparently they build a wall in their mind and retreat behind it when life gets them down. Sounds nice, but it also sounds like a load of old tosh at the same time. We've got a Mexican standoff between the Japanese and the English in Blackthorn's courtyard on training day. Fuji will give her life to defend Blackthorn's guns. A real Second Amendment nut. I got a little choked up when she demanded that he give them to her. To quote Rick Springfield, where can I find a woman like that? Then she pulls a Glock on Omi. Hey, I told you she was not to be messed with. She's amazing. Especially with that little swallow she does beforehand. Like she's saying, I really have to do this. I want more Fuji's armor. I also like the way Mariko hesitates before interpreting for Blackthorn and apologizing for the misunderstanding. It's the subtle things that make these scenes so terrific. Great acting by our girls here. So it's revealed that the Japanese have had guns for 50 years and they don't need to be told how to use or care for them. Just the tactics. I've been wondering who Cosmo Java sounds like, and I think I've worked it out. It's John Hambling from Play School. Naughty John, rest in peace. Morris was crying, wasn't he? I'm never going to get it downstairs and get the work done. What? Blackthorn tells them to forget about the guns and just worry about the cannons. They can blow a hole in the castle in Osaka, no worries. They don't think the cannons are any good, but he shows them to be very accurate. Blackthorn is shown admiring the landscape. It really is quite breathtaking. I swear he's even shown trying to listen to the rocks grow, building his eightfold fence. Mariko is reading Blackthorn's journal and she warns him that he will not be able to turn Toronaga to his side. But Blackthorn says they have common enemies. Blackthorn experiences his first earthquake and Mariko explains that he's why their houses are so temporary. Because the entire world is out to destroy them, there is no point in making things permanent. Kiku is trying to goad Omi into doing something stupid. If only he was in charge instead of Yabushi. Every little scene has ramifications for future scenes. It's also tightly interwoven. It's a blink and you'll miss it kind of show. Subtle nuances mean it's not the kind of thing you put on in the background while you're folding your socks. This also rewards repeat viewing. Uh oh, Ishido's men are here. Josen wants Yabushi to return to Osaka and renew his allegiance to the council. Poor old Yabushi, he's always stuck in the middle. He tells Josen that he's the best chance Ashido has of winning the war. Stay the night and we'll demonstrate the cannons tomorrow. Nagakado, Toronago's son, doesn't see why they should be allowed to witness the cannons. Yabushi tells him that it'll help to reinforce with the council that you don't mess with Toronaga. This next scene was fantastic. Blackthorn's trying to understand the predicament Yabushi's found himself in. He wants to try some natto, which I believe to be fermented soybeans. Then he offers Fujisama one of his pistols and offers to train her. She says she'd rather pull a gourd from a horse. You what? I assume she means take a pumpkin from a nag while it's eating. Not that she's extracting it from his bum. But she goes and gets her father's swords for Blackthorn to carry, as she can't be consort to a man without swords. When Blackthorn thanks her, 
The look on her face is priceless. It's like she sees the effort he's making. Lovely scene. And he loves the natto because it's very stinky. <laughs> I love it. Omi and Nagakado are discussing the implications of Josen arriving. I couldn't work out what angle Omi was playing here. Was he trying to get Nagakado to send for his father? Or was he trying to get Nagakado to attempt to prevent Josen from being present? Possibly challenging him to a duel. I'm pretty sure that was who he had the confrontation with in Osaka when Shido turned up unannounced as they were leaving. Blackthorn is again enjoying the scenery when Mariko comes down to enjoy some scenery too. Very cheeky. This scene gave me goosebumps. Such good sound design. The flashbacks of Mariko's past, all fascinating. Blackthorn reciting what they would do in London is reminiscent of what Mariko said about the Eightfold Fence. Walking along the Thames at night allows you to forget all of your worries. The music in this scene really gave me chills. So well matched. Okay, someone explain this to me. And you'll have to bring your best evidence, because I can't work out if that was Mariko that engaged in hardcore pillowing with Blackthorn. Against. One, she was wearing a different colour of clothes. Two, she doesn't look like Anna Sawai. Three, the next morning they speak as if she wasn't there. Four, they state explicitly that they both thought the courtesan was a good gift. Points four. One, they just had a scene of talking romantically after which Mariko doesn't seem interested in reading. Two, Anna Sawai has said that she used a body double. Three, people who have read the book or watched the 80s series said it's her. Four, maybe she's just not wanting to talk about it in public and made the courtesan thing up to keep up appearances. Five, she said that sex is a healthy part of life, so she could knock boots and not think anything of it. The big final scene, the one you've all been talking about. Josen is having the cannons demonstrated for him or at him. Pretty confronting effects. I've seen few effects better than these. I'm sure it's mainly CG, but wow we is it ever effective. Josen lying in the mud with his arm mangled really leaves an impression, as does Mariko's delivery of the final line. And the episode is over. Such a good show. No one can argue that episode 4 of Shogun The Eightfold Fence deserves anything less than a 9 out of 10. I could see an argument made for a 10, but the absence of Toronaga brings it down for me. He's my favourite, so my bias is showing. Another minor gripe is the vignetting of the camera lens. I'm sure it was a stylistic choice, but if your attention is drawn to the edge of the frame, it makes me feel like I've got blurry vision. I wonder if this is meant to act like a sailor's fuzzy recollection of events in days past, or if it's the same lens as they used in the 1980s version. Again, the sets and the costumes are wonderful, with beautiful scenery and lavish clothing. I cannot believe this is not Japan in these shots. Give the location scouts a raise. The acting is great again, with real conviction behind the lines and great delivery. Mariko, Fuji and Blackthorn's chemistry is building nicely. I also like the extended screen time for Nagakado. He's really portraying the uncertainty behind the young son of the Busho who is trying to prove his worth. Every scene is just setting up more and more permutations for rivalries and backstabbing. Every scene has ramifications for the future that mean you cannot look away, even for a minute. This has become my Tuesday night ritual, watching Shogun multiple times to pick up on every minute detail. James Clavell wrote six books in this series, and I hope all of them get made into a television series if this is the level of quality we can expect. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.